Yes, so I, Monica and I have lived in East Twickenham since 1993, nearly 30 years. Um, the area has evolved in that time, um, much as any part of London does. I'm not going to cover everything that's in the book tonight. Um, the book is some 200 pages, so um, there's a lot of content in there. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about how what was originally known as Twickenham Meadows became the Cambridge Park Estate, um, and then into the, the, I suppose, like most of Richmond, the fairly affluent riverside suburb that it is today. Um, I'll look at the 19th and 20th century Little and Fawkes families, who were responsible for a lot of the, the more suburban development of the area, um, and uh, Sir Vince Cable, when he wrote the foreword to the book, um, he said maybe they should be considered as dodgy developers, but I think there is an argument that, at least in one case, really they were local visionaries rather than, rather than dodgy developers. I'll talk about the, the area that became known as Belgium on Thames, uh, the munitions works in the First World War, and um, I'll also then talk at the end just about how that area evolved into the, uh, the world ranking ice rink that I'm sure some, if not all of you, uh, will know about or remember, um, and which met its fairly contentious demise in the late 80s, finally to be demolished uh, in the early 90s. And in fact, I think it had come down just before Monica and I moved into Morley Road in the area. I'm hoping the slide will advance. Whether the, ah, there we go, very good. Um, I was just wondering if our, our massed audience was blocking the signal from my controller, but. So, um, the map, one of the maps that shows the area um, when it was first recorded is the Moses Glover map from 1635. Um, which is, can be seen at Sign House and is in the collection of the, uh, the Earl of Northumberland, now the Duke of Northumberland. And if we look on the, the left-hand side, and I won't use the pointer for the audience here because I don't think the Zoom audience will see it, on the left-hand side where the black arrow points to, uh, that is where Cambridge House and the Cambridge Park area is located on this map. Um, north is not facing upwards on the Moses Glover map. Um, and then on the right hand side of the slide there, uh, I've linked it to uh, a blow up uh, where we can see uh, Cambridge House, which was known as Twickenham Meadows at the time and was ascribed to the Countess of Totnes, um, three acres of land, Countess of Totnes being one of the, the very early owners of the site. On the map on the right, uh, on the left hand side of the, the black and white map, uh, you can see Ham House and Ham just over the river. Um, the area of Twickenham, which was vulgarly known as Twittenham at the time, um, just up to the north. And then in the bottom, uh, the bottom of the map, uh, with the, the, word, the word for the river, Temesis, um, just there we can see Richmond and a bit of Richmond Palace there, uh, or Sheen Palace as it was originally known. So that locates the area uh, back at the, close to the beginning of the 17th century. Another pause, there we go, very good. So some views of, of Twickenham Meadows um, from later on, an en engraving here on the left-hand side by uh, John Lancia, based on a drawing by, by John Webber of Twickenham Meadows around about 1803. Uh, we can see Richmond Bridge there on the right of that, that top left image there, um, and the relatively extensive grounds going down to the river from Twickenham Meadows, uh, completely or largely uncultivated at that time. And then a later view bottom right there, actually from 1905, um, which is uh, taken or shown from a similar angle um, and this was after the work was done by the architect Lewis Army, who I'll talk uh, briefly about later. Uh, so the two front bays that were added 
to the to the house and the extensive conservatory that was added on the the left hand side of this this view of the house so jacobean house um, built around about the same time as ham house um, sadly no longer there today it was demolished in about 1937 um, but there was some recording done of the interior and exterior by historians and um, architectural experts at the time. So we know a fair amount about the house, both photographically and, um, and in written form. So some other views, the, these are early 20th century views of the house top left uh, with the bicycle there um, that's actually the uh, the face looking out onto what is now Cambridge Road and uh, just hidden behind the house there very left of that photograph we can see what was the the bus garage that was built um, bang next to Cambridge House um, bus garage that in fact persisted until the 1990s uh, but was a bus garage and a, a tram garage um, earlier in the 20th century. The view at the bottom there is of the uh, the main hall of Cambridge House as it was at this time. Um, it actually became the Middlesex County Club uh, around about 1910-1920. And on the right hand side, just as an example of some of the detail in the house, um, there's some hand-painted wallpaper. Um, it was very beautiful inside, very ornate. Um, and uh, in many ways a great loss i think to the area um, that it's no longer there so twickenham meadows cambridge house had some 14 significant owners um, over its history uh, it was built by or for sir humphrey lind um, probably by an architect known as Grimser Rich, um, as I said, about the same time that Ham House was built. It passed through the Cantus of Totnes as the Moses Glover map uh, documents um, through Sir Thomas Lawley and then came into the hands of the Ash family who owned it for s almost a century, some, some 80 years or so. Um, I won't talk a lot about the Ash family tonight. Um, there's more in the book. Uh, but they are closely linked with the family that owned the Felbrigg estate in Norfolk, which is now a National Trust property. Um, and again, waiting for the animation. Um, so the uh, Catherine Ash became Mrs. William Wyndham and the Ash family evolved to become the Wyndham Ashes uh, and then later the Wyndham Bowyers um, before the last of that that dynasty at the time the last of that dynasty who owned the house um, they actually he actually got into financial difficulties and the house was sold to somebody who uh, goes by the name of valence Coman, who was a bit of a bit of an interesting character he backed privateer pirate raids in the caribbean um, he also uh, in some ways i think created the profession of actuaries he he devised life expectancy tables and um, uh, effectively the, the beginnings of life assurance. Um, so something of an accountant, um, whether he was a bit of a dodgy accountant, I think remains to be seen, but um, certainly an interesting character. So he sold then to Richard Owen Cambridge, who's probably the most, the most well-known of all the owners. And I think if the house was still standing, I suspect that uh, Richard Owen Cambridge uh, would be as, probably as well known or almost as well known as Henrietta Howard and some of the owners of Marble Hill House, um, perhaps almost as well known as Thomas Walpole uh, at uh, Strawberry Hill House. Um, the fact that his property is no longer there means that he's been to some extent lost in history, um, although there are quite a lot of writings about him online and uh, a certain amount of academic, academic study that's been done on Cambridge. Um, some of which is in the public domain online. So Richard Owen Cambridge um, passed it on to his daughter and then quickly on to his son, Archdeacon George Owen Cambridge, um, still known, I think, in the area because he helped found the Archdeacon Cambridge schools in Twickenham. 
and it was he who renamed the house Twickenham Meadows to Cambridge House in memory of his father, Richard Owen Cambridge. Through a leaseholder then on to Henry Bevan. Henry Bevan was connected with the Barclays family, brewing and banking family, and a precursor of the, uh, what we now know as Barclays Bank. And then on to uh, Lady Chichester, Caroline Chichester, um, who eventually passed it uh, because she died uh, without children, um, passed it on to uh, Sir, Sir Edward John Dean Paul, um, part of that family. Lady Chichester, again, another, another interesting character. Vince Cable picked up on the aristocratic nimbyism that uh, really she was uh, responsible for. Uh, she opposed the development of the tramways in the area and her solicitor, in fact, stood up in the House of Commons and talked about the, uh, stopping the, the ragtag and bobtail from disgorging before her ladyship's lodge. <laughs> um, they did manage, she did manage, though, to uh, prevent the development of the tramways for about 25 years, uh, till the beginning of the, the 20th century, um, very shortly after electricity came to East Twickenham in 1902. So a little, little bit of a closer look then at the circle around Richard Owen Cambridge. Um, I've talked about his son up there on the left, an image there of George Owen Cambridge, um, courtesy of Twickenham Museum. Um, he had something of a romantic relationship with Fanny Burney, Francis Burney, who was a contemporary author. Um, author of uh, Cecilia um, and, and other novels at the time. Uh, they, they never, the relationship between them was never, never fully, I can't say consummated, because certainly not that, but um, uh, not fully reciprocated. Um, and it was interesting, although she spent quite a lot of time at Twickenham Meadows, Cambridge House. In fact, she also drew the attention of George's father, Richard, um, and there was a certain amount of tittle-tattle, a certain amount of gossip amongst the ladies of their acquaintance that, in fact, Richard Owen Cambridge spent almost as much time with Fanny Burney as, um, as George Owen Cambridge did. So uh, George eventually married a, uh, a lady described as young and beautiful, Caroline Van Meerop, um, and settled into a relatively happy marriage, we believe, with her, although she was some... 13 years younger than, uh, younger than him. And Fanny Burney married a French emigre called uh, Alexandre Dable, who came over after the, uh, an aristocrat who came over after the, the French Revolution. So Richard Owen Cambridge um, really, well, I think, was at the center probably of Twickenham society at the time. Um, he had many well-renowned visitors uh, from all walks of life. Um, Horace Walpole, up there, top right, um, resident at Strawberry Hill at the time. He was a, a frequent visitor, um, often overstaying his welcome. Um, and he seems to have had something of a difficult relationship with Richard Owen Cambridge's wife, Catherine Mary, um, seen there bottom, bottom right in the image, bottom right in the painting. Um, described her as old cherry tree, not quite sure why, but um, but he, he was both complimentary and less complimentary about her. Um, described Old Cherry Tree as, on occasion, very good humoured and gracious, um, but once said that a Yorkshire Sunday is as prudish as Mrs Cambridge. Um, so clearly a little bit of a love-hate relationship there between the two of them. But Cambridge, Cambridge and Walpole seemed to know everybody. Um, they knew James Boswell, the biographer, Samuel Johnson, uh, the writer, um, Joshua Reynolds, the painter who lived up on Richmond Hill for a while, um, and many politicians uh, and other arist aristocrats and politicians, including Lord North, who was prime minister to George III. And Walpole seemed to take a lot of pride in those relationships. And he wrote in 1755, we shall be as celebrated as Bay or Tivoli. And if we have not such sonorous names as they boast, we have very famous people. Clive and Pritchard, the actresses, Scott and Hudson, the painters, 
My Lady Suffolk, famous in her time as Mrs. Howard of Pope and Gay, Mr. Hickey, the impudent lawyer, Whitehead, the poet, and Cambridge, the everything. And I think Cambridge, the everything was a, a worthy title, a worthy name for, for Richard Owen Cambridge because his interests and accomplishments were many and varied and included a flair for landscape gardening. So he was responsible for the, the early landscape gardening of the grounds of Twickenham Meadows. And this was at a time where 18th century gardening was moving towards more open aspects and pastoral idylls. Um, and the formal gardens at the time fronting the, fronting the house between the river and the house underwent drastic change. Cambridge was fortunate really. He, he didn't have to, to work for a living. Um, his father sadly died when he was nine and he was brought up by his uncle Thomas Owen, hence the Owen in his name. Um, Thomas Owen was a, a very wealthy lawyer who retired early and um, left his estate to, uh, to Richard Cambridge. Um, and Cambridge, Walpole and uh, Soam Jennings, the writer and MP, they were known collectively, collectively as the old wits. And they were regular visitors at gatherings where, where George, who was a young curate at the age of 27, first met Fra Francis Fanny Burney the successful author. So, um, tales of unrequited love there, to some extent, um, but not for, not for Richard Cambridge and, and Catherine, Catherine Mary. Um, theirs was a relationship of some 60 years or so, um, and uh, Cambridge wrote and talked about that, that very close relationship they had, um, and he was continued even late in their marriage, continued to be delighted when she walked in the room. Um, so clearly a, clearly a happy marriage. But the estate didn't last, as we know, forever. Um, if we look at the, the Warren map uh, there on the right, um, George Cambridge and his wife didn't have children. And when George was in his 80s, um, both lack of children and, to some extent, lack of funds uh, meant that the estate was divided up. And the, the Section A there on, on the map, uh, drawn on the map there, uh, was sold on to the Henry Bevan family. And uh, George Owen, Owen Cambridge and Cornelia Cambridge kept the area um, marked as B there, so the area to the south of Cambridge House. Um, just on the edge of this excerpt of the map, you can see Marble Hill, just to give you some, some more context there. Um, and there, there was uh, a house uh, shown on one of the earlier maps called the Glass House, uh, which was just in the southeast corner of what is now Marble Hill Park. And there's a, there's a whole separate tale around the Glass House. And it, it's curious that in some of these early maps, it was picked out and named, whereas Marble Hill wasn't named. And, Twickenham Meadows, Cambridge House wasn't named on the maps either. But George and his, uh, and his wife built a new home for themselves, the early incarnation of Meadowbank, um, which still exists in a different form today, in a, in a remodeled and very, very modern house. Um, Meadowbank was also the, uh, known as the Exiles Club in an earlier incarnation, um, the club for returning engineers and others who, who worked for Cable and Wireless when Cable and Wireless was really the, the communications center, if you like, the communications hub for what we knew as the British Empire. Uh, and curiously, Monica, my wife's uncle and grandfather, both spent time in the Exiles Club um, way before we came to the area uh, because they were both engineers for Cable and Wireless in their careers. So the, uh, the area was, the, the estate was uh, separated, separated up um, just to the north of Section B on the corner of what is now Alexandra Road, for those of you who know the area well. Um, George Owen Cambridge built uh, in fairly rustic fashion um, Ely Lodge there, which was at the entrance to uh, that, that Section B, uh, Part B of the estate. Um, and so that can be seen in around about 1830 um, in the engraving there. 
and the photograph there, bottom left, of Ely Lodge in 1910, uh, so it persisted for quite a while. And there is now a, uh, a much more recent, probably 50 or so years old, uh, block of flats which still goes by the name of Ely Lodge. And the name came from the, from the um, uh, to, to some extent, um, came from his connection uh, with Ely and Ely Cathedral and his, his religious connections with that part of East Anglia. So the, the area continued to evolve. Um, the next significant pers personage in terms of development was Jeremiah Little, who was a respected builder from Kensington, who came into the area mid 19th century. And he had three sons, Henry, Alfred, and William. Um, Henry, perhaps the most well known of them, and he can be seen here um, in the photograph uh, as chairman of Twickenham Urban District Council. He's the one with the, the flowing white beard. Um, he was also a Middlesex County Councillor and a church warden of St Stephen's and really one of the, one of the founding fathers, if you like, of, of St Stephen's Church that um, started construction in 1875 uh, to a large extent taking over from Montpellier Chapel, which was the, uh, the main religious building uh, for the area at the time. So well-known pe well people, um, and certainly Henry probably, probably better known, in fact, than Jeremiah. So 1866, the two of them had acquired what was known as the 10 acre field, um, freehold land. That's the area, I'll point to it on the map here. Um, it's the area here just, uh, just to the northeast of Marble Hill Park. Um, so just really the area above uh, the, the lettering Cambridge Park on the map here. And there was an ancient right of way um, separating, uh, separating that, that 10 acre field um, between two rows of houses now. Um, and that's now known as St. Stephen's Passage obviously named after the, after the church. They built a whole series of houses, uh, fairly significant houses really, of, of different sorts. Um, five houses on the west side, known as Beaufort Villas. On the east side, seven pairs of semi-detached houses, now Cambridge Park Gardens. Um, and along the line of the, the carriageway running from the Rising Sun pub, um, the pub that's gone through many names, even in my time here, um, uh, still back, unless it's changed very, very recently, um, still back under the name of, of the Rising Sun. So six more detached villas. Um, those are showing on the map just above the letters, uh, the letter in Cambridge Park. And a coach house for Alfred Little's own use, um, which, if this works, is um, uh, just there. So set back from the six Victorian villas, and for those on Zoom, that's just above the, uh, the word Cambridge on the map. Um, and in fact, that coach house can still be seen today, although it's hidden somewhat behind a 1930s house that was built um, just in front of it. But those buildings completed the triangle that's uh, around, surrounded the triangle that's now Cambridge Park Bowls Club that was founded in the 1920s. Uh, and in fact, the, uh, the People who undertook bowling at the time, they had been bowling just to the west of the Rising Sun pub uh, before the club was, was formed in the 1920s, and that's still going strong today. So yet more houses followed. Um, in the, in the, uh, the following years, a total of 37 houses were built in Cambridge Park and five in Richmond Road. Um, the old lodge by the Rising Sun was demolished um, and became the entrance to coach houses and stabling, uh, then known as Beaufort Mews. Cambridge Park Mews was built, um, coach houses and stabling with living accommodation above, um, built to the rear of Ely Lodge um, that I was describing earlier. Um, and that, uh, I'm told, had become, in fact, um, has been described as something of a slum by the 1960s. That may be a, a slight exaggeration, but um, I think was dilapidated by, uh, by, by the 1960s. 
Henry and Alfred, as mentioned, helped to build St. Stephen's Church, um, and that construction was not completed until the, until the early years of the 20th century. Um, but by then, Henry and Alfred would, were owning 20 houses between them and some 16 stables and a workshop. 1873, Jeremiah Little himself died, the father died. Henry lived on at Cambridge Park House, Alfred uh, in Cambridge Park, and Henry's new development at the Barons was complete by the 1870s. So that's the development very close to what is now St. Margaret's Station. And Henry lived at Barons Holt, number 14 at the time. And so the area just really between the station and uh, Twickenham Studios, I guess. So were they dodgy developers? Were they local visionaries, this family? Um, I think if we look at some of the architecture that's left, really some very fine Victorian buildings. Um, top left there, Hatfield House, was very close to uh, Morley Road, where I lived until very recently. Uh, went through various incarnations, was a, uh, a prep school in the, 19 th in the 1930s. Um, is now uh, uh, converted into a set of fairly fine apartments. Bottom left there, Burley House, um, photographed there a couple of years ago. Um, Burley House had been a nursing home during its earlier life. And in fact, Virginia Woolf had two or three stays there during her mental health difficulties um, in her time in the area. The coach house seen there in the middle of the slide, um, photographed in 2006. Um, photograph supplied by Margaret Wilson, who uh, is still alive, a um, member of the family who grew up in the house, um, sent me the photograph, and some of her ancestors, in fact, had established a market garden business there um, back in the early parts of the 20th century. Beaconsfield in the bottom, bottom centre there, um, one of my favourite properties in the area, uh, just photograph from the road, again, another, another fine building. Not all of them survived. Uh, on the right there, a couple of photographs uh, from the sale notice for Glenshee and Glenshee Gardens. Um, bottom right there, uh, taken from the carriage approach uh, and the top right uh, from the garden side and you can see the conservatory there. And in fact, that property is connected with the houses at the bottom of Morley Road, uh, which are now, I think, three separate residences, but were originally stabling, and then a garage for one of the first motor cars in the area, and chauffeur's quarters as well. Um, and there's a nice photograph of, of uh, those in the book. So the second significant family in terms of development, um, the Fawkes family, Henry Cresswell Fawkes, builder, bought Cambridge House, and about 30 acres of parkland in 1897. Uh, very rapidly built, uh, lots of streets of houses. Um, he worked with uh, a family member, Morley Punch and Fawkes. Um, and I highlight the names on the slide because these are the names of uh, streets in the area. They also built a series of mansion blocks, uh, which again, most if not all of you will, will know from the, the mansion blocks close to Richmond Bridge. Um, all built in a, a similar style, they're far from identical, but uh, and they also all have similar decoration around their entrances. And uh, Frank's also developed Alexander Cambridge, Clevedon and Denton roads as, I suppose, suburban house, housing, but a, a fairly fine set of, of houses uh, in those roads. Uh, and he developed the, the shops, or the majority of the shops, on Cambridge Parade, which uh, later was known um, as uh, Numbers on Richmond Road. And again, many of you may know the Charles Harry Pharmacy uh, on Richmond Road, uh, with a very similar facade to when it was first built uh, some hundred years ago or so, um, and well known well known uh, to inhabitants of East Twickenham. Uh, they very kindly also have been selling copies of my book, um, so I'm indebted to them for that. Um, and there's a nice tribute to Ubi, Ubi Singh, who was the pharmacist there for about 30 years or so until he, he died 
a few years ago, um, in his 50s, I think, um, rather precipitately. So lots of, lots of houses, lots of shops. Um, to give you a, a different perspe perspective on the geography of the area, um, on the right-hand side, the Ordnance Survey map that was revised 1910-1911 and published around about 1920, just after the First World War. Um, you can see the uh, Cambridge House uh, just by the river, uh, sort of top right of that map. Um, and then just below Cambridge House, and I'll, I'll use the pointer um, for the audience here, um, the, the large building just south of Cambridge House, there are the beginnings of the commercial buildings that became known as Richmond Bridge Works, and then later evolved into the, the ice rink. Um, and the, the streets here, Cresswell, Cambridge, Morley Road, Denton Road at the bottom, and then the beginnings of Clevedon Road here, just on the, uh, the riverside of Cambridge House. And the aerial photograph, top left, um, again from about 1920, uh, slightly different view. Um, you can just see just north, uh, just north of Cambridge House there, the bus garage uh, that uh, persisted for some 70, 80 years. Um, a good view of lots of the mansion blocks here as well. Also worth mentioning, I think, um, and really there's a, there's a history, uh, it has a history in its own right, the Gaiety Cinema, uh, which is the building uh, just here. Um, so for, for those at home, uh, I guess it's to the, just to the south of the, uh, the undeveloped area uh, on the top left of the photograph, um, the Gaiety Cinema, which has a, something of a volatile history, um, it began, in the time of, or before the talkies, uh, so time of silent movies, uh, ran for about 20 years and uh, went through countless different managements, um, struggled to survive. Uh, there are some lovely tales though about when it went through the pandemic, the, so the influenza pandemic, um, just after the First World War. Um, and some of their adverts talk about disinfecting the site and um, Curiously and paradoxically, from what we now and now know about infection, um, it was somewhere warm for people to go at that time. So you know it was heated and enclosed, which of course is not the advice we have for, for today's pandemic. Um, but um, yeah, it's it's a fascinating history um, in its own right, really. And that became a billiard hall until about the 1950s. Uh, and um, much of the building is still there today, uh, Richmond Bridge business centre, um, so business offices as well. Uh, and you can see some of, some of the original engravings uh, on the floor of the hall there from, from when it was the, temp the Temperance Billiard Hall. So a few images here, a few perspectives on Richmond Road. Um, top left, uh, a view looking towards the bridge, so with the shops on the right hand side. Uh, the tram, one of the trams that started in 1903 and ran till 1924. So very much a posed photograph with a member of the staff there standing by the tram. On the right, so looking away from the bridge, um, looking to where, uh, looking towards Twickenham. Um, again, uh, see all the, the shops on the left hand side, the, at that time largely undeveloped right hand side because that was a series of villas, um, including Ride House, which is still there today next to the, the, the little supermarket, the new little supermarket. Uh, bottom left, uh, so that's a view looking up uh, from the, the corner of Richmond Road, um, the motor works, the garages on the left there, catering at the time, I guess, for the emerging uh, motor omnibuses um, and motor cars. Um, in the early years of the 20th century, um, but the quick fit garage still a still, still a motor garage today. And then on the bottom right there, uh, showing a little bit of the corner of Morley Road, and oh, sorry if I just go back quickly. Um, 
uh, just here the the dairy so the canopy for for the zoom audience the canopy on the right hand side of the the shops in the bottom right photograph um, that's the uh, what became the express dairies in the 1970s um, but was the Clark dairies for a long while um, leading up to that point and the Clark family owned home farm just on the north side of Richmond Road and indeed other da other dairies in the area as well so almost the last chapter then um, in the development of the area um, Belgium on Thames uh, which a historian called local historian called Helen Baker coined I think to talk about the Belgian community that was present around the First World War and in fact I've learnt tonight um, just before we were um, just before we all sat down that in fact there was a Belgian shop on Richmond Road still in the 1950s um, so the Belgian community did persist way beyond the the First World War although curiously they had largely disappeared by the Second World War and this was was written about at the time a Franco-Belgian engineer um, called Charles Pellabon uh, started up a munitions works um, having fled from Belgium with the German invasion beginning of the First World War he started up uh, a munitions works in fact in Teddington to begin with and quickly moved his his enterprise to the site just by Richmond Bridge um, uh, the site that became the ice rink um, and is now Cambridge Gardens um, and um, he employed probably some 2,000 people in the munitions works as a whole uh, the extended Belgian community numbered probably 6,000 or so and there was a bit of a, a southwest corridor so the community was not just in East Twickenham it was not just in St Margaret's um, not just in Richmond, um, there were pockets of a Belgian community really stretching out southwest from, from the centre of London. Um, women working in the munitions works, uh, which I guess for wartime you may, you may well expect. Um, sadly, not many of them, in fact none of them reached um, levels of senior management, um, but they were, they were there and some became known as canary girls because of the yellow from the explosives in the factory um, but there was a there was a whole community and not just people living they had uh, a philanthropic society there was a contingent of Belgian boy scouts um, there was a Belgian school uh, there was a Belgian department in one of the the local English schools at the time um, and lots of other social groups social societies as well um, I'm very fond of the, the image on the, the right hand side there of a Belgian acrobat um, doing some acrobatics uh, just outside the, uh, the factory at the time um, with his hand on what I assume is a, a shell case um, so we just hope that the shells were um, the shell cases were empty at the time um, I assume so um, but a very a very established community So um, a lot of Richmond Road was taken over by Belgian shops. Um, on the right there, we can see the building that is still there um, just by Richmond Bridge. Uh, and I think that's, that's, that's the one with the, the grocers. Um, there's a clockmaker, watchmaker, jeweler there as well. And then in the photograph on the, on the left hand side. So those are the shops on the other side of Richmond Road, the Morley Road side, the um, Cambridge House side of Richmond Road. Um, there's a cafe, a, a butcher's, a boucherie, um, uh, quite a few other Belgian Belgian shops, Belgian businesses. There's a yes. There's a perhaps perhaps amusing, depending on your perspective, uh, story about the Belgian cafe up on Hill Rise, up on the Richmond side of the river, um, just over the river that. Uh, became rather well known and I don't think it was just because it was a cafe um, apparently it also served as a brothel at the back um, so um, uh, I assume serving shall we say the um, the Belgian community um, but it had something of a something of a mixed reputation at the time and the buildings themselves the factory uh, the factory buildings themselves a couple of views here on the right hand side 
That was the face of the building that uh, faced onto the river and a sentry just in front guarding it. Um, there was a detachment of Belgian soldiers actually attached to the site as well, providing some protection. And on, on the left hand side there, um, just really moving along from the right hand image geographically, um, some of the buildings and the distinctive architecture and the domed roofs uh, there that uh, became significant for later developments. And groups of workers, and I assume here on the very left, a group of girls or young women, I think girls. Um, and interesting, interesting around uh, the female members of the workforce, uh, because the two communities, the Belgian and English communities, kept themselves fairly separate at the time. Um, but there was some mixing between them and some relationships, not all of them successful. Uh, there was one relationship which did persist. Um, and for those of you who know the, the Hamilton family, the, the Waterman, um, the Hamilton's Ferry, um, Alice, uh, one of the daughters at the time, uh, married um, Edouard Labbé, um, Teddy Labbé, um, a Belgian who was working in the factory. And in fact, they migrated uh, to Belgium, back to Belgium, back to Brussels for him, um, and had a son also called Teddy who may still be alive, certainly until fairly recently, was, uh, was alive uh, in his 90s in Brussels. So the site, the site became the ice rink. Um, after the war, munitions no longer so needed. Um, and the reason I was pointing out the architecture there, because the buildings were adapted to become the ice rink, they had a fairly challenging commercial history to begin with. Again, two or three different managements in the 20s and early 30s before they settled down and the site became as successful as it did. Uh, the top image there is uh, the, it was taken in the 1950s, um, the cafe that fronted the building um, just above the steps that went down to the river that you can see in the, in the bottom there of that top image. Um, and uh, the bottom Im image there, the, uh, the ice rink uh, wording that was on the, on the front of the site um, right until it came down in the 1990s. Um, it was also known as the sports drone earlier in its life, um, more around the 40s and 50s. And a couple of images there, we can see sports drone on the, the top left image, that's 1969, 1970, that top, top left image. Um, and the bottom image, at the bottom left image there, just showing the inside and the dome ceiling. And that was the main ice rink. At the time, there was a secondary ice rink uh, known as the Arosa rink uh, that uh, we believe was built, uh, in fact, over a, what was originally a swimming pool. Um, and there are, there are lots of tales about how they, uh, the water was brought into there and the ice was maintained. Um, early in its life. But hugely, hugely successful site. Um, lots of well-known names, Torval and Dean, for, for those of you who know the names from that generation, um, the Torval and Dean ice skaters. John Curry was another well-known Olympic, um, Olympic skater. Um, lots more names. Um, and many, many generations of local people and from further afield who came to the ice rink uh, to skate. Um, and it, it really, uh, even today, still arouses so much affection from people uh, and interest from people. But it wasn't an entirely happy story. Um, uh, again, some of you will remember, I expect, the, the end of the story uh, to some extent. So Richmond and Borough gave permission to a commercial enterprise, um, the London and Edinburgh Trust, to develop the site and apparently remove the stipulation that a, another ice rink should be built in the borough to replace it. Um, there was so much, so much strength of feeling. There was a petition about the closure. People marched to 10 Downing Street, um, but the doors of the ice rink did close in 1992 and the building was demolished shortly afterwards. Um, even in 1995, just there, top right of the slide, there was an early day motion 
in Parliament um, and the MPs bottom right there um, who signed that and supported that. So there are still debates in Parliament um, about what should happen to the site um, even after it had closed and, and demolition had happened. And there was a, a local campaigner, Richard Meacock, um, who had a gallery on Richmond, Richmond Hill. Um, he used to park his, I forget whether it was a Morgan, but one of his, his, uh, his vintage car up there or his um, model vintage car um, and campaigned against the closure of the ice rink for, for many years. Such was the strength of feeling and I, I had lots of, lots of messages when I was researching the book. Um, I'll just read you the, the quote there at the bottom of the slide that was on social media during the early stages of the pandemic. We were promised a new ice rink, time has come for it to happen. We as a country need projects like this to restart our country. It's a good time for re renewing our thoughts. Maybe we can build kindness, togetherness and teamwork. I would have given up on life if, it, if I hadn't had the family vibes from Richmond Ice Rink. I have been to many rinks and none have made me feel so safe and so at home. Perhaps one of the most passionate expressions of, of that affection um, on social media, but uh, there are a lot more and there's a, there's a whole Facebook group um, with memories of, of Richmond Ice Rink as well. So it became, it was redeveloped into the uh, the luxury apartments that you can see in the image uh, on the slide there. So top, uh, bottom, bottom right and the, the gardens that were, the, that were redeveloped into Cambridge Gardens. Um, so the, the whole commercial site came down and was redeveloped. Fortunately for some public benefit in terms of the, the gardens that are there. And Helen Baker and others uh, set up, established this memorial um, so Helen, uh, Helen and others set up a group uh, to commemorate the Belgians uh, in 2014 and in 2017 this memorial was unveiled by the Belgian ambassador, I think with about 250 people present on the site at the time. Uh, the memorial, I believe, was, uh, was designed or part designed by a local resident, Sue Bonfanti, um, and there's an inscription on it from a nine-year-old girl from Orleans Park. Um, it's one, one, of the locals, one of the local schools in the three languages that were used at the time, uh, Flemish, French and, and English. Um, so the, that can still be seen, you can walk past that um, every day today. So something of a, a whistle-stop tour um, really through the history of this area. Uh, there is lots more to talk about, I can't cover it all tonight. Um, I've talked a little bit how, about how Twickenham Meadows evolved into Cambridge House uh, and Cambridge Park. I've talked a little bit about the Little and the Faux families, um, the evolution of that area just by Richmond Bridge uh, that became known as Belgian on Thames and the Belgian community and that arrived at the, the world famous ice rink and its contentious demise in the, in the late 80s, uh, which still very much um, loved by memory and um, still talked about today. A few quick words of thanks, um, a few names up there on the slide, um, people who contributed to the book, um, Helen and I mentioned Vince Cable who wrote the foreword, Rachel Morrison at English Heritage who's been enormously supportive and Monica my wife and editor sitting at the back and Annie Rushton my designer who was a, a friend and neighbour so another resident of the area. And thanks to Robert and the Society for the invitation for the talk tonight and for all of you who've joined either in person tonight um, or on Zoom. And if I can give an unashamed plug for the book, um, if I may, um, special offer £15 for members tonight. Um, it's available elsewhere. And if anybody isn't here tonight and wants to buy it online, there is a reduced, a discounted shipping offer um, on the website. Uh, the Richmond Bridge Media, the cartel website, um, if you'd like to order, order it. And I do a, a sporadic blob, on, a blog rather, rather than blob, um, blog on Facebook as well, my author's page on Facebook. So thank you again. Um, very happy to take questions uh, and I will hand, a, hand back to Robert, I think, at this stage.
Jonathan, thank you very much indeed. Before I open up for questions, can I just ask, this is, this is only just a taste. The book is much, much more to offer. I hope you're all going to buy the book if you haven't got it, got it all, uh, already. But tell me, how did you start the process of doing this research and why in the first place? And how did you, how did you go about it and how long did it take? I, I was helped enormously um, initially. I mean, I've lived in the area, as mentioned, for nearly 30 years now um, and always been interested in my interest in history. It goes back, I guess, to O-level as it was at the time, GCSE now. Um, so history is O-level, you know, back in my, dare I say, 40 years ago or so. Um, a lovely lady called Maureen Bunch wrote a lot about the area about 30 years ago and Twickenham Local History Society gave me permission to reuse some of her content uh, which provides the basis for the the early chapters in the book so some of the early research um, so that was a, a great starting point and I've added to it with a mixture of book research online research um, some oral history what was uh, what was great about setting myself up on Facebook for this is that there are local, as you will all know, there are local history groups on Facebook. Um, there's the Memories of Richmond Ice Rink group on Facebook. And people just came up with stories, um, contacted me separately. I had phone calls from people. Um, the Bowles Society were interested and provided a bit of history. Um, I, was, I was contacted, actually, a lady who then went on to, to buy the book uh, by a descendant of the Faux family. Um, who uh, didn't know an awful lot. Um, I think she was a granddaughter, I think that's right, or great granddaughter of Henry Fawkes. Um, didn't know an awful lot about her early family's history. Um, so was fascinated. So yeah, lots of, I mean, he, really it became a bit of a community project, I guess, because there was so much community interest and, and community contributions to it. 